Okay, hello everyone. Okay, so I'm, I'm Guillaume Tucker. I'm here to talk to you about what's called first party um, kernel and org build environments. But build environments is basically about uh, containers. Um, so quick intro. Of course, to build to build a kernel, that could be very simple. You can just do a make config and make. So if you're building on your native uh, architecture and doing nothing special, it's very simple. But that stops very quickly. Um, if you're building for a different architecture or if uh, you're building some new features on Linux next, you might need a very recent compiler. Um, things are getting a bit more stable. For LLVM, you can have a wider range that works. And Rust is also starting to have um, good support for, you know, fixed versions of, of Rust that are going to be supported for a long time. Um, but there's always, you know, it's very easy to fall into situations where you can't actually build the code or you don't, it's not obvious how to build it or you can build it in many different ways and if someone reports a problem, it's hard to know exactly how it was, uh, how they reproduced it, how, how they caused it and how to reproduce it. You have done a word map actually based on the, the actual number of um, word counts of these words in the kernel. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot of things. <laughs> and yeah, the, the tools on top of that, like if you want to build the documentation and spars and all, all the other things. Um, actually, uh, yeah, I've put a quote here from the standard tool chains provided on kernel.org that basically illustrates that, you know, for LVM, uh, you might have to choose a very specific version if you want to be able to build a part of the code or reproduce a particular issue or even for performance performance reasons. Uh, so these, this is just so everybody is on the same page about what I mean by the kernel.org tool chains. So they are tables, binary tables with the binary uh, tool chains that are built uh, specifically for uh, compiling the kernel. So they don't have uh, libc, they're not made to, uh, to link user space applications. Um, and they, Cover GCC. That's called it's called a cross tool, but actually it also works for um, building on the native architecture. And then there's uh, the LLVM part, which includes the REST compilers. Um, so it's comprehensive because it covers only basically all the architectures. Maybe some obscure ones are not covered, but it is like 15, 20 architectures. Uh, cover there with uh, recent versions of all the dual chains. I should have said also some old versions. If you want to build some older kernels, there's an archive with very old GCC you can use for that. Um, and like I said, it's tailored for kernel builds. So that's the kernel and all tool chains. Now I wanted to mention uh, TuxMake. This is actually where kind of the, the idea for this talk came about. So a long time ago, uh, when I was working on, on kernel CI, there were some people from uh, Linaro who said maybe we should make some universal containers um, for building the kernel. And there was this discussion at the time, and I think Linaro wanted to um, come up with their own product with, with specific requirements, so it was complicated to have something upstream that would work for everyone. Um, and since then, this idea has been kind of floating around. Um, so Linaro have done, a, you know, I've uh, gone a very long way with doing this. So now there's, you know, this TuxMake tool, which you can use to reproduce completely a uh, build, and it's even possible to reproduce it with a binary identical um, kernel image. And now uh, they've um, added this um, collection of containers built on the kernel.org tool chain that I just mentioned in a previous slide. So the standard ones um, pr are provided by Linaro tool chains, I think, that are built by Linaro, but at least the Docker images are made by Linaro. Um, and now they've made a, there's actually a blog post as well to explain um, that there's uh, a series of containers, Docker containers, with a kernel.org tool chains. That's only for Clang, as far as I can tell, and it's pretty recent, it was made a few months ago. It's It seems more like an experiment, but it's an interesting one. So it seems like it's also converging towards having um, an upstream friendly solution. Yes? I can give a little bit more context to the kernel.org tool chains. It was uh, mostly around uh, speed, uh, so they're faster than the Debian versions, um, and then they, uh, they're they also uh, designed to be a little bit more uh, widely available uh, for people through uh, like an older libc and, and things of that nature, so um, that was kind of the main reason for uh, them to make a separate container uh, with those uh, available 
um, but then still having the Debian ones available for uh, other people. So. Okay. So, all right, so this tool chains and now I've made some continuous. What's the issue again? What, 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 why are we talking about this now? Um, so tarballs are nice, but not very convenient, of course, because you have to download them by hand and extract them by hand and remove them by hand and manage them by hand and uh, install them in just a path. Um, so it's useful, but not as useful as like a package or a Docker container, for example. Also, it doesn't include all the other tools. Uh, that well, the, This is like the minimum set of dependencies you need to build a kernel, typically. These are like Debian package names. Um, and these don't come in the tarball. So you have to install them, which is not very difficult, but it means on a, on a different system, even using the same binary tarball, you might have a different version for these tools. In principle, it should be fine, but that's the theory, and in practice, well, sometimes you might have a different um, outcome. And uh, yeah, tarballs are uploaded by individuals, typically by Arn Bergman, I suppose. Um, I think Bootlin also um, are b b building some of that. Um, so, it's not like there is uh, a set of build recipes. I don't, I, maybe there's one somewhere, but it's definitely not in a kernel tree. So if you want to add a new, um, uh, add a new flavor, for example, or modify slightly how the tool chains are built, it's not something you can do just by sending a patch to the kernel mailing list, for example. It's managed, it's not closed, of course, but it's it's a bit harder to discover and harder for people to contribute and, uh, and uh, work with. And in practice, I want to say everybody, except people who don't use containers, <laughs> most people use containers, uh, especially for automated testing. Uh, that's where it makes a lot of sense to use containers. So this is kind of like an, an elephant in the room. Like if you want to have your small chains more easily available, discover, discoverable, if that's what, um, then having them as uh, published containers uh, facilitates that. So here's like in an ideal world, which is very, typical of modern software development, I want to say. But, um, you know, so you have the source code for the tool chain, then you can have automated pipeline that would build the tool chain and package it as uh, tarballs, which I suppose is probably kind of um, what is being done now, except I haven't seen like a GitLab pipeline or anything like that, but you know, there's, there's a way to transform the um, tool chain source code into tarballs. We could also add, um, Packages with metadata like .deb or some Yocto IPK or RPM or whatever you want. Yeah, the idea is that you could then um, describe the dependencies, requirements, and then it would be easier to install. You can easily remove them, even if they're not in like upstream Debian. You can still depackage install your um, uh, tool chain. That would be a bit easier than extracting a table, for example. And once you have packages, then it's very easy, or even if you don't have packages, you can extract them in, in Docker image. But having packages is even better. So then uh, you can build a Docker image and push it to Docker registry, and then that's a great way for people to be able to reuse them easily. And then you have, of course, you can manage them with uh, tags. I'm saying Docker, I mean, it's container images. So yeah, nothing actually too groundbreaking in 2024. Most projects do that from the start in principle. Um, however, so why are we not there with the kernel? Uh, well, part, part of it because the kernel has been around for a long time, but also um, it's a complex project with lots of different subsystems. And we've, you know, lots of people have talked about this before. Like there was a, there was a thread recently a few months ago about using uh, GitLab, for example, GitLab CI in the kernel. So one of the first replies from Linus Torvalds was, uh, you know. We don't want to have a top-level CI system for the kernel, at least he doesn't want that. Uh, I guess the issue is to avoid having a vendor lock-in uh, kind of syndrome. So then if you need GitLab, uh, and then GitLab changes, goes away, can you still <laughs> release kernels and that thing goes away? Um, so, and the same applies if you're using GitHub or you know, a particular cloud vendor, if you rely on some kind of technology. So. Um, what I'm suggesting here is there are some things that are not vendor specific. So there's the Open Container Initiative that has, they've made a standard for container images. That's not specific to Docker, but Docker uses that. But you can also um, use other container managers like Portman and you can create your own. Um, <laughs> I don't think you should, but <laughs> just to say this is not specific to a particular um, container manager. So if you make images 
standard images, you're not locked into any vendor kind of thing. Um, and if you want to host your own um, registry without relying on, on Docker Hub or on GitHub registry or something like that, you can host your own typically with uh, Harbor. Um, I think it's very well known, but it's worth mentioning, you know, remind, reminding to people it's not very hard to deploy a registry like that. Um, you can also save images as files, uh, but you know, that's very a lot less efficient because you lose um, the layering, I think. So, um, I mean, it's really hacky, but if, re if you really don't want to have a registry, you can still save images by dump them and then import them again. So they can be managed like tables <laughs> as you know, GZIP files. Um, now, if you don't want, if it's hard to use a standard, uh, if, if it's hard to use a, like an off-the-shelf pipeline system like GitLab, uh, GitHub or GitLab, it's also possible maybe to have uh, Git hooks, for example. So every time, um, uh, the idea is uh, every time some changes are made in the Docker files, uh, if the Docker files were in upstream kernel, that could trigger uh, some build to recreate the Docker images. Or we could have that as well for the uh, um, actual toolchain builds. Um, but this is maybe a bit the part where some, some more ideas would be welcome. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure exactly what's the best way to do this. At least doing it by hand would be possible. It would still be better than not having the Docker images or container images. And uh, yeah, so going back to something more, less controversial, I would say, um, what's important is also to not break the current uh, workflow. So if people are currently using the tables, I'm sure some people are using the tables, make sure that they are still available so people don't have to change the way they work. Um, and if we add packages, you know, we, we keep the, the existing ones. And if we add container, container files, they're like Docker files basically in, in the upstream kernel tree, that would be something for people to obtain if they want to use it. Um, but if they don't, then fine. You know, it's like maintainers wouldn't need to build their branch with a Docker image or, you know, People wouldn't be required to use Docker uh, or container images to do anything in the kernel. It's more to facilitate things. Um, and then Nathan said, okay, so what about, okay, if we have containers, how do we make it easy for people to actually use them? How to make, it, make them uh, discoverable? And a great way to do that would be to have, again, optionally, uh, a way in KBL itself to say, okay, instead of just doing make, or in my current host environment with my host toolchain, I want to do make um, in, in a container. So for example, if you say make and container equals a GCC version, you would expect behind the scenes that uh, that would fire up a container with the image mentioned here and do the make command inside it. That would be like very, um, low barrier, like very easy for people to, to use. Um, so first of all, like, <laughs> to do like a small uh, survey, does that seem useful? <laughs> Raise your hand if you think that's useful. Yeah, <laughs> doesn't seem to hurt. Okay. <laughs> does anybody feel uh, strongly against it? Like, does, is it like, why? <laughs> no, nobody seems to have a um, container phobia, so that's, okay. Um, and can it be implemented? Kind of, so I've made a proof of concept. 10 lines <laughs> at the top of the make file. Yeah, it's a bit small, but I've, um, uh, there's the other PDF that's uh, stored on the, I've made a version with just one line here with a link to, um, to a GitLab repository with the kernel with this change. So you can actually have made an improvement based on that. You can take a look if you want. So here yeah, it's just, um, if you define container equal something, then, uh, well, that's more like debug, you know, it's, it's, it's running in a container. And here there's like the magic actual um, make target uh, that we'll call, here it's called Docker, but you can change that if you want, which will fill it inside with all the, all the arguments that are normally passed to make. And so if you do this, yeah, well, here I was using a, a Docker image had locally, we can do this with a, with a Linaro ones or any one you can find. Uh, it actually kind of does it. Um, there, there are a few, um, a few pitfalls with that. 
I can spend a bit more time explaining it, but that's more like a proof of concept, you know, that it between yesterday and this morning. So, um, there's lots of things that could be done to improve. And as part of that, uh, I also discovered a new planet. No, I didn't <laughs> discover it myself, but running Make inside Make, I realized there's a small planet outside on the outskirt of the uh, solar system called Make Make. But <laughs> if you want to call it like this. So, um, yeah, that's basically what I've come up with. <laughs> And yeah, vielen Dank. <laughs> I don't really speak German. But. So any, there were some concerns whether this was really a tall chain talk, but I guess it falls in between things. Like it's a bit of a CI talk as well because people more likely use it in automation. Sometimes it can be a bit of a hassle to have to manage containers when your host tall chain is exactly what you want already. Um, I think it's useful when when a CI is producing some bug reports and you want to re reproduce that uh, exactly, it's, it's good if you can have, you know, pretend to be a CI and reproduce exactly what the CI has done, for example. And maybe if you want to get started really quickly, you don't have all the dependencies installed, um, that can also help. Yes, question here, microphone. Um, can the kernel encode metadata of what it was built with besides the toolchain, like can the kernel encode the metadata that was built with a particular container registry, like uh, coming from sort of like uh, supply chain security, right? Like mm -hmm. everyone would prob presumably want to be able to reproduce their yeah. kernels and have some six store. Yeah, if you run your name, you'll find the type of compiler that was used, but that's more like up to the build to, to define it. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good point, yeah. I mean, I definitely think that it would be possible to throw some of that metadata into just like an elf section or something. I mean, there already exists the dot comment section that will tell you the compiler and the linker usually. Um, at least in the case of Clang and LLD, they'll like insert that metadata, and I'm sure that that could be done for uh, yeah. Like I'm sure that that can be done for more tools um, if the reproducibility of them, uh, or like the reproducibility of an issue kind of depends on that particular version. Um, I'm not really sure how, how common it is for the other tools in the system other than the tool chain to, you know, uh, cause an issue or like be the root cause of a problem. Like for example, like bash or something, you know. Um, there are definitely cases where like newer make versions might cause a problem, but that's not necessarily going to be encoded in the, uh, like you're not going to see those problems at runtime or uh, anything like that. You'd see that mostly at like build time, for example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, certain metadata, I would, I would assume it would make sense to have that encoded somewhere. Um, it would probably, we would probably just have to figure out exactly what pieces actually matter for. Yeah. It could be a very simple problem like the merge config script, for example, if for some reason you run it with a different version of bash and it doesn't exactly merge the things as you want it to, it still builds a kernel and then later you realize, oh, that feature is missing or performance is not quite. So it could be very subtle, but uh, yeah, it's possible. <laughs> but if you, um, with a container image, you have, of course, the, the checksum. So if you include that, you know you can reproduce it exactly. You might reproduce the same image with a slightly different checksum, but at least if you know this is exactly the the same checksum as what was built, you know you're talking about the same thing. And for git commit as well, so. And it would, I mean, it would definitely be useful to have, you know, to have that in there if you were doing that build and if those, uh, if those containers were available for people to, uh, to actually use and consume, mm. right? Like, it's not entirely useful if you don't have the, if you don't have the container with that exact hash available to you to reproduce, but maybe. Yeah, and uh, about metadata, I guess most CI systems will have that outside of the kernel image, so you can keep track of it, and then they can add, I guess not standard, every CI system will have their own way of describing exactly, well, hopefully exactly how it was built. So, yeah. Having a standard way of putting it inside a kernel would be interesting. Okay, right. I think we have a cool. bit of time left.
So one other thing that would be useful to have, though it's not really a part of the tool chain uh, in these sorts of containers or readily available, would be QEMU or other emulator environments for particularly the stranger architectures, because as useful as it is to have you know, a tool chain targeting some architecture, uh, to actually be able to test it easily would be great too. Yep. Actually, Leonardo would do that as well. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, kind of, uh, it's the same. Yes. It's a great next step, of course. All right. So, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks. Feel free to send more questions.